think it would be very useful if, uh, when you ask it, when people ask a question, they also just identify where they are from, so it might be easier to get a good answer to the question. But, yes? Um, you want to answer? Um, well, I mean, I think that there are certain areas which have, um, you know, which are belonging to the common good. And when you have too much market uh, involvement, then there is a contradiction between the profit making and the, the benefit for the people. I mean, you can see this right now in the United States where um, I mean, the two big to fail banks of Wall Street um, and a couple of other, uh, you know, like the Bush family, uh, a billionaire with the name of T Bone Pickens, they have bought all the water resources in the last 10 years. I mean, they have bought every land which has a lake or groundwater, aquifers. They have invested in water pumps, in membranes, in uh, chemicals for water purification, just everything which has to do with water. So they have cornered the water market. And they are speculating on that the price goes up because you know they, it's like an Enron. Uh, Enron <coughs> was in the oil area, in the energy area, and they speculated on the energy price going up. They wanted to have a high return for their investment. And the problem is, you know, that you know the high price of water does not go along with the need of the population. Water is a human rights. Water should not be a speculative item. I mean, there are certain areas which should not be due to market principles. Why? Because it, I tell you why. Because if if you have in Southern California right now people who are on the lower end of the income. And they have to pay four times as much for their water bill, and they're not watering their lawn. You know, for them, it becomes the question, if you have to buy bottled water, which is controlled in the price by Nestle, and you cannot afford it, 
you know, you, you, you turn segments of the United States into third world conditions. Uh, the lack of, there are two billion people right now on the planet who have no access to clean drinking water. And obviously the life expectancy of these people is highly shortened because they are subject to get disease, they die earlier, they, you know, they, it's just not, it's just not human. And you know, you cannot, I mean, there are certain areas, I, I'm not saying that private entrepreneurs don't have their place, but there are certain areas which are so much linked to the common good that the state must provide the framework for the private enterprise to function. And you know, therefore, also investment in, in infrastructure is not a question of private interest. If you try to build the Silk Road by making toll booths along the Silk Road, you can forget it. You know, you can forget it. Basic infrastructure is the precondition for economic prosperity. Water is part of it, uh, health system. If you privatize certain areas like the health system or the education system, then you end up where we are right now. You end up with a situation where 80 individuals own as much as, no, as 3.5 billion people. But you have a large quantity of very poor people. And this gap between very rich and very poor, I mean, there are people you know, who are quite concerned that if that is not remedied, that you will have an explosion. You will have civil war in the United States what do you think will happen? Why, why did I say that the uh, Klaus Stiegel uh, <coughs> reorganization is the only way to prevent chaos from happening? Because if you have an... Oh, I'm sorry. If you have an uncontrolled collapse of the banking system, which would result in, in chaos, I mean, the United States is already a powder keg. You know, I mean, the United States, I don't think people have a clear idea how the violence in the United States has become a factor. The, the shootings in the schools, the, you know, when you go shopping to a mall, you have an odd chance in Washington that three, four people every day get killed for no good reason. Because the violence has become such a, you know, element in the society, that if you have an uncontrolled collapse, you have militias, you have, you know, I mean, you, you, you are looking at the potential 30 years war chaos. And in France, the same thing. The, the suburbs in France are already a violence problem. What do you think will happen if we don't change this and bring development to the Middle East, to Africa? Do you think these thousands of refugees will be all? I mean, this, this model of, of, of only emphasizing high profit has failed. You know, and I think that we still have time to draw the conclusion and say we have to correct a model which did not function. And you know, I think that if, they, if there is a, a, you know, go back to the post-war period uh, in Germany, you had industrial banking, you know, people like Hermann Abs. He was an industrial banker. He was not an uh, investment banker. There was once the idea that the banks are the servants of the industry. And I think that that's how it should be. It should not be that the bankers are the top of the world. Why? They're not producing anything useful. They should have a small salary and that's it. <laughs> 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 Yeah, uh, thank you. If I could uh, add a few words, I, 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 I really appreciate this uh, very sharp uh, observation. I think uh, the question essentially is, uh, uh, can Silk Road uh, be built by market, or how much role market can play in, in uh, economic cooperation and in, in this uh, um, initiative? I, I think um, definitely if you look at China's economic development, okay, it's a whole history of in the last three decades, it's a, it's a process of you know, 
market penetration, accepting um, uh, 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 justifying legitimating the, the role markets. So, uh, but I think to make you know uh, such a big, a huge project, you need a new forms of market. You need a, a new forms of market influence uh, that is uh, can be uh, better coordinated and regulated. Even some markets, like uh, like financial institution, has to be uh, generated and uh, uh, manufactured by the by the by the state. So. Um, so I, I think basically uh, market definitely would have a role to play, like PPP. So the Chinese government, there has been a lot of discussions on how uh, private sector can uh, involve in this uh, initiative uh, through markets, through uh, BOT or PPT uh, 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 <coughs> mechanisms. So I think um, definitely there would be a role to play, but it would be a coordinated you know, um, um, process. And also I think, um, you talk about the uh, normative uh, uh, role, um, and I think the shared um, understanding, shared um, identity, although there has been so much, you know, uh, 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 varieties of cultures, and, and um, uh, the fabric of cultures, uh, ethnicity, so different, and along this uh, uh, region, so uh, a kind of you know uh, sharing understanding norms is very important. For example, the importance of interconnectivity is really important. Okay, um, so to so as to again, I think this is also a precondition for um, uh, cooperation. Yeah. Yes. I'm ambassador of Bosnia. I'd like to do you have any media strategy how to promote this idea? How to convince? How, how to convince people who are elected politicians. It is a huge business in the United States to, call, to elect a new president. And it is also very important. Is there any, any strategy? Uh, well, I mean, <coughs> it's, it's not so easy because the media um, are, let's say, more focused on defending the present system as it is. Uh, and, um, you know, that in a certain sense, that's why I say, you know, why I started with a dilemma. I said I have to talk about why I think that this approach is the only war avoidance, that you have a, a new model of international relationships which is all inclusive and we are trying very hard to get the United States to join. You know, we have launched this petition, which you can find there at the book table, I think, uh, where we invite, you know, we say that we want to get the United States and the European nations to join with the BRICS, because only if you reach a different plateau that you can neutralize this conflict we have right now with, with between the EU and Russia and NATO and so forth, which is super dangerous. And if we don't change the dynamic, so what we do, we contact all kinds of institutions and people and ask them, sign this. And that is also a way of making the idea more known because the media, they did not report about the BRICS summit at all. They did not report about uh, the Silk Road Initiative. They say, they, 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 for example, when President Xi Jinping went to Sri Lanka last year, Instead of saying, oh, the maritime Silk Road is growing and we should be happy, they said, uh, India will be very unhappy because Sri Lanka is in the backyard of India and therefore the conflict between China and India will get bigger. And it's completely untrue. You know, but that's how they think. I, you know, I use the <coughs> example that you know, since the media are so much married to the old way, to the old paradigm, you know, I don't know if you remember that uh, Hegel, the, the German philosopher, he wrote this uh, um, the phenomenology of the mind. And in the introduction, he's, he's, he talks about the world historical individual. And he said that the servant or the kammerdiener, the, the person who helps dress the world historical individual, 
will never recognize the world historical individual. He will, will only see, oh, his trousers must go to the laundry, and he has this problem and that problem. So he's unable to recognize the, uni the universal individual. But Hegel, with whom I normally don't agree, but on that point I do agree, he says, this is not the problem of the world historical individual. It's the problem of the Kammerdiener. Huh? And that's the problem with the journalists. They, 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 have, they, they are so, I was a journalist. You know, I, I'm sort of still half as a journalist, but you know, <clears throat> and I know how, how they function. They have this idea of the, in German, you call it the vorauseilende Gehorsam, uh, that you anticipate what your editor wants you to write, and then you write that, and you don't even think what is the truth. You just think what you think is expected from you. And that's how you get this completely stupid coverage. You know, that, that for example, uh, I'm, I showed you the picture of the IDB, uh, which uh, in, in 1975, we had campaigned to implement the bank proposal of my husband, the IDP. And, you know, we got that pretty much into the final resolution of the non-aligned movement in uh, 76. So at that point, I called the uh, chief of the officer of the day of the Deutsch German press agency. I said, oh, when are you covering this? This is fantastic. And he said, oh, that's not newsworthy. I said, but this is two-third of humanity. They just agreed to have a new world economic order. And you say, this is not newsworthy. He said, yeah, we don't cover that. And there are certain what they call taboo subjects, which they just don't report about no matter what happens. So what we have to do is a little bit more difficult. We have this resolution. I ask all of you to, to sign it when you go out, and not only sign it, but you know take it to your friends and colleagues, circulate it, because it's also a perfect way to make people even aware that such an alternative model exists. You know, if you have access to some magazines or publications, have them write about it, that there is a world movement growing you know, to go for a new model of international relationship, because obviously this present model is, has brought us to the verge of World War III. And it, it really has the potential of extinction. And I think that you know, everything depends if we can get to enough people who have the intelligence, who have the morality, to say, okay, you know, we can, I mean, we are human beings. When we go in a way which was an erroneous way, no camel and no dog and no donkey can say, this is not useful and I do something else. They will continue their doggy way, their donkey way, uh, you know, but human beings are intelligent, they are creative, they, you know, they can always change the mode of their existence in a willful way. You know, and I'm very hopeful because you can see with the rush to the AIIB that this new model is very attractive. You know, because it offers cooperation, it, it offers win-win chances for everybody, and therefore I think it is eminently possible to change it. My name is Eric Philipson, and I have been uh, very interested in uh, uh, global conflicts ever since eight, uh, 1985, when I attended a conference in Louisiana uh, where uh, the same subjects were spoken about as today. And I was wondering if I had become a member here very recently of a secret society. Uh, because it seems to me that all the answers you are giving to the world problems today are much better than the ones they came up with at that time. So I'm wondering, why did you not try to use some of these trillions to make a little publicity? I, I think uh, uh, one of the things I discovered in the case of Putin and, and his problems with his unpopularity in the rest of the world, except for Russia, was that Berezovsky, who fled, and who was his uh, almost, uh, his, the one who really made Putin 
uh, the president. When he came to London, the first thing he did was hiring the world's most expensive publicity manager, Lord Jim Bell. And he managed to make Putin responsible for the murder of Anna Politkovskaya, uh, Litvinenko, uh, the, the spy, and a lot of other things. And he published, I don't know how many books and films and propaganda things. And the result was, Putin is now probably uh, the world's most unpopular person. Whereas in his own country, it's the other way around. So my idea is, spend a little more money on publicity. Very good idea. Uh, did you direct that question to me or to him? <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a more relevant to your. Uh, well, I, 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 I mean, I'm sorry, you could start with making it possible to hear everything you say here. In, why don't you use a microphone? I, I heard most of what you said, but I would like to hear most all of it. <laughs> well, unfortunately. I don't have trillions <laughs> in the Chinese government has trillions, they should obviously use it. But, you know, I mean, one of the reasons why we are, um, you know, in a certain sense able to, to think new ideas is because we are not dependent on big money bags. So I don't have access to trillions, you know. But if you want to support the effort, give a donation to the Schiller Institute and we put it to good use. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the ideas are, are invaluable, right? so it cannot be. <laughs> um, definitely, I think I really what I appreciate a lot is uh, the this um, alternative approach of development. You you are advocating that paradigm shift. So uh, ideas matters, and 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 we need to find a way. Uh, like in academia, we we need to find a way how to. Uh, uh, effectively or creatively deliver and transfer ideas into spread ideas into society mm -hmm. and uh, and policy makers so that's and also some somehow check the uh, uh, discourse uh, produced by media somehow um, to to create a more balanced and nuanced understanding yes. You want to take it in English? It might be easier. Is oh, okay? it should. It should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is, yeah, I have to my name. And uh, I have a question about uh, the, the, you could call it project as such, the whole scheme. And I wonder um, how you view that have an opinion there, uh, how important it is that the, the Jewish join it. Because, of course, it is uh, absolutely necessary that uh, Europe joins it. And then again, you can ask, is it necessary that you, as such, join it? Uh, and the, because if you look at the map, you could say, well, if you cannot have a one, the whole of work embracing all of the countries. We're going to maybe go to the five polar. That's, that is uh, better than the single polar <laughs> world where one of the countries is decided to think. So that is my question. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I, I think. Uh, uh, what I understand is this part, this uh, one bear one road, it's an it's a open uh, 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 platform. So definitely uh, the uh, major power like US, the, the involvement of US will create some new dynamics on, on this and, and will, will substantialize some efforts. So I think it's, uh, uh, it, it's in, inclusive, I, I think. China, China, China would have no reason to reject uh, U.S. involvement um, in one way or another. But um, 
What is interesting is that this is a approach that, uh, uh, if we compare with the uh, TPP negotiation, uh, that's quite different. Okay, so um, TPP want to create an, a a a um, a new form of bilateralism. Okay, so deliberative uh, in the very beginning is cool in China. So I, I think uh, um, uh, this is too uh, too too to paradigm of, you know, um, economic cooperation. Yeah. Oops. Well, <laughs> since, you know, I'm married to uh, Mr. LaRouche, and he has a political action committee in the, in the Democratic Party, which is called LaRouche PEC, and, you know, we are campaigning in the United States to change the United States away from confrontation. And, you know, we have, for example, <clears throat> something which is called the Manhattan Project, uh, which is the idea that we have, because New York is a, is a sort of a special city. It's, ve it's very metropolitan, it's a melting pot. You have all the 180 nations of the world who live and work together well in New York. And the New Yorkers also think they are more intelligent than the other Americans, <laughs> uh, which I agree with. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, so we, we try to build a support base for the United States joining the BRICS. And we have almost every four weeks uh, events, and this is now spreading to other, you know, places. And, you know, in a certain sense, it's, it's, we, are, we are trying to, around O'Malley, we are trying to build a new presidency uh, which reflects this paradigm. Because you see, the problem is most politicians nowadays are really stupid. I mean, I don't know if you, if you, <laughs> if you met any recently, you know. I mean, they're so concerned about their position and their election district and their whatnot. They are not thinkers. They don't study. You know, they're more concerned. In the United States, they're more concerned to get big money from Wall Street for their election campaign. And then they're in the pocket of these people, and they don't think they should. For example, if you try to tell them that they should study weather patterns or ancient philosophy, or you may as well, you know, I don't know, want to, you may as well do something totally superfluous, you know, because they don't do it. They call the police. Yeah, they call the police. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it's true. And, a yeah, that's, huh? <laughs> talk about the weather, you're a terrorist. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we had, we had some uh, people going into the uh, state legislature in Sacramento, and we said, look, we have a whole uh, spectrum of proposals, how we can solve the water project uh, problem in California. And then the, the, he said, I will call the police. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it was completely, I mean, he just, you know, he was just so fixated on rationing of water, of cutting the water, of implementing all these bureaucratic rules, which will lead to the death of California. And then if somebody comes and says, no, wait a second, let's make more water, huh? he completely flipped out. And that's, that's very typical, you know, because if people think that their power position is depending on the, the powers to be, you know, and, and then they, they, they regard any new idea as, a, as an existential threat. You know, it's almost like you know, Friedrich Schiller, according to whom the Schiller Institute is named, uh, was regarded by um, Metternich in the, uh, after the Karlsbad uh, degrees. Schiller was forbidden. Can you imagine this? As a, he was put on an index. So the students naturally were more interested in Schiller than before. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you know, I, I think that you know there is. And Friedrich Schiller wrote about it. He said the Brotgelehrte are the most reactionary element in history because they will fight any new idea because it would either force them to learn more and they don't want that, or you know it, it threatens their position. So you know it, it's it, it's really a war of ideas. In the light of all this wonderful new silk road bridging and making the world better safe, 
what actually do you, how do you feel this wonderful good force can fight this horrible black evil force that is going on which is carrying the world apart? Well, <laughs> No, it's a practical one. It's not a hypothetical one. I mean, look, I, I mean, we start with an image of man which proceeds that man is fundamentally good. Um, and that, you know, if you give people a choice, that most people will decide for the good. I, I, in my life experience, I have met a couple of people and encountered a couple of people who I would say are hopelessly evil because they decided to be evil and they cannot be convinced. But that's not the normal condition, you know. No, but they're the ones who are the decision makers. Yeah, but they are bankrupt. <laughs> Their system is about to collapse. Okay. Um, I mean, look, take for example the Middle East. Uh, because of the wars based on lies, First the Iraq war, no. then Libya, then attempted Syria, Syria Vietnam, now, now uh, no, 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 wait, let me, let me make my yeah, point. Uh, you know, you have created now a hell. Uh, you know, you have destroyed Iraq, you have bombed it back to the Stone Age, you have destroyed all the cultural goods in Syria, you have, you know, it's, it's just a complete hell on earth from Afghanistan all the way to Africa. So how do you, what idea do you have to remedy that? Well, I mean, ISIS right now pays uh, up to $3,000 to their recruits. Most of this money is uh, printed, you know, it's falsified money, but these people naturally don't, don't know that. Why? Because they are poor, you know, they are also poor. So if we propose, which we have done already, uh, we have here one of the, he's just not here, but we, you know, we already in 2012, we had a conference in Frankfurt where we proposed to extend the Silk Road into, you know, this region. If you take the region from uh, the North Caucasus, Afghanistan, the Mediterranean to the Gulf, you know, this is like a, a big square region, which right now is completely destroyed. So if you extend the Silk Road into this region and build water, you have to declare a, a war against the desert. We have developed a whole new program how you can conquer the desert in this region, how you can put in infrastructure, build new cities, build um, you know, industrial developments so that the young people of this region have a chance to have a better future. You know, if everybody is poor and everybody is, is miserable, that breeds more terrorism. The, to, if you make, take military means to, defa to defeat terrorism, it's like a hydra. You cut off one head and 30 new heads grow. I mean, that's the experience of the long list of failed wars in this region. But on the other side, if Russia, China, India, Iran, Egypt, Syria, hopefully Denmark, hopefully Germany, hopefully the United States, if they all join hands and say we have a gigantic Silk Road extension into this region, you know, and you get to the young people, you know, who, I mean, the young people are young people, that's always the good thing, you know, that young people have to live for 50, 70 more years. <laughs> so what world do they want to live in? Do they want to have a world which is just horrible, terrorism, fear, destruction, hunger, war, or do young people want to build a better future? And that's why I really like what Narendra Modi said. He, he said, we have to build a mass movement for development in India because I cannot do this alone. I need all the millions of young people to join in and build this. You know, and I know that there are even some people in the Arab world who, who are extremely interested in this proposal. You know, and that's the only way. We have to develop Africa. I mean, I find the present policy of the EU the absolute declaration of moral bankruptcy. Yeah. You know, I mean, to, 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 to use the Triton Coast Guards to drive people back 
with the idea that the more people are drowning, the better is the deterrence for those people who would come after that. But that is the evil force I'm talking about. Uh, yes, it is like that. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> the conversation is very interesting. <laughs> um, let me add a, try to add a footnote to that. I, I think just like this flower, so you, the flower cannot flourish if you have no mechanisms to carry pollen. So this flower would would, uh, would die very soon. Uh, this civilization would die without connections. This, uh, this is a simple metaphor to show how important in the connectivity or inclusive de uh, uh, development is important. So I think this, uh, this idea has been, um, uh, has been somehow uh, institutionalized or crystallized by um, from what I think uh, observed uh, by a Chinese policymaker. But Again, we need, you know, communication to make it a more uh, a kind of shared understanding. This is a very fundamental issue of, as you suggest, the human uh, civilization, challenge to human civilization. As a matter of fact, I will give this poor plant some water right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michelle, we're, we're running out of time. We have time for one last question. Michelle? Yes, it's, it's a question to you, actually. <laughs> uh, I'm Michelle Rasmussen from the Schiller Institute in Denmark. And uh, in terms of this conference, this conference was actually organized in, uh, in eight days, mm. in just a little over a week, where we had cooperation. So thank you so much from the Confucius Institute for hosting it. We had cooperation from the embassies. And, uh, and if, if we can build towards the next meeting, and everybody here Become engaged in that and build a process where we do get this out to uh, many more people, then, uh, then we can do this. And uh, so 